Hello and welcome to Southside at Home. I hope you all had a great Canada Day this week and a good time celebrating living in such a great country. This is our opportunity now to celebrate Jesus, so I invite you to sing with us. Boy. 
As we pray the Lord's Prayer today, when we pray in particular, your kingdom come or may your kingdom come soon, um, I would just commend to you this little passage from Revelation 21 that uh, describes in some ways what the final kingdom coming looks like. Uh, John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's think of that as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil. The kingdom, the power, and glory belong to you forever. Amen. Have you been reading some good books this summer? As I think back over the years, there are some books that loom large as my favorites of all time. The kind of book that you read more than once, maybe once a year. And probably the first one that comes to mind for me is the, the trilogy by Tolkien called Lord of the Rings. And then there's the little, um, in, in terms of time, earlier single story about The Hobbit, which is also lovely. But um, as we begin a new series today uh, that we're calling A Longing, I'm, I'm going to depend on some of the ideas that come out of uh, literature, art, music, uh, as well as the scriptures as we s spend uh, time through the summer months uh, thinking about a longing. And in The Return of the King, um, one of the parts of the trilogy, there's just a delightful little comment that um, I, I would love it to kind of lock in our minds. And I hope it'll 
kind of come to mind as we think about all of the wonderful things that God has for us um, in that which is yet future for us, which is going to be kind of the, the focus of our talks. Sam Ganji um, says to Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. And then here's the line. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Don't you love that expression? Is everything sad going to come untrue? We're going to talk about that this summer. And uh, indeed, the powerful answer is yes, absolutely. Everything sad is going to come untrue. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Here's a a little excerpt um, narrated by Tim Keller. Tim has been the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City for many years. And uh, he's reflecting on two authors whom he admires. They happen to be Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And he, he picks out the, um, the way that the fiction of good literature actually becomes a good faith story. So I'd love you to just listen to what um, Keller says, and then we'll carry on talking about um, um, a longing. I've always been so impressed with how J.R.R. Tolkien led his atheist friend C.S. Lewis toward faith in Christianity. You know, J.R.R. Tolkien and Lewis were both uh, teachers at Oxford. Uh, Lewis was a lecturer, Tolkien was a full professor, a little older. Tolkien was a, uh, a very devout Catholic Christian believer. Uh, Lewis was an atheist, and one day, Walking on Addison's Walk, around, along the river Cherwell, by uh, Lewis's rooms, Tolkien made an evangelistic move that basically laid the foundation for that atheist becoming a believer. And I've always been amazed. You want to know what it is? To understand it, you got to go to Tolkien's not that easy to read, but absolutely crucial to read essay called On Fairy Stories. One of the things that he says on fairy stories that I think is amazing to me is what he calls secondary belief. He says when, um, when somebody tells you a story and you know it really happened, that's primary belief. But when someone tells you a story that you know is fictional, you know it's fiction, but it's so well told and the characters are so well developed and the plot is so well developed too that even though you might sit there at the movie or listen to read the book and you really kind of indifferent yet you get you get drawn in right you get scared you get happy because uh, if the story is well told Tolkien said then the story commands what he calls secondary belief it draws you in it makes you have the feelings as if to some degree it was true you get just scared even though you know it's not true but you're scared for that character and you care about that character and you're excited when you see the resolution because that secondary belief first thing that's very important then he goes along and says there's a kind of story that human beings even today even today we live in a secular realm a secular time a scientific time and and the, and the, the leading lights of modern literature uh, have been telling us you know life is meaningless then you die uh, and yet Tolkien says we still crave a certain kind of story we crave it in movies, we crave it in, uh, you know, in books. And these are stories that depict a supernatural world. We're just fascinated by that, those stories. That depict being able to cheat death, escape death, escape aging in time. Stories that show us a love that is eternal. A love without parting, a love that, that overcomes death. We want stories about good absolutely triumphing over evil, destroying evil. We love love stories about victory snatched from the jaws of defeat or sacrificial heroism that brings life out of certain death. And we pay money to watch those movies and we pay money to read about those stories. And you know, the, the modern literati hate they're, they're myths, they're legends, they're fairy to- stories, they're fairy tales, basically. 
and modern people say life is not like that. But Tolkien points out the fact that these are deep human longings. And for some reason, human beings, even in our day and time, want the kind of stories that are very, very well told, that evoke secondary belief, that catch you up in them, that tell you that good will triumph over evil, that there is a supernatural world, that you're not stuck in time, that there is love without parting, that there is a way of escaping death. Now Tolkien said, why would people still feel this way? Now what Tolkien's about to say here, I can't prove from the Bible, but it fits in with the Bible. He says, we're made in the image of God, but we're fallen. And therefore, weirdly enough, human, being know, human beings know at the de fact level, we all do have to die. That evil often triumphs. That no matter how much you love somebody, eventually you're going to lose that person. Or they're going to lose you. And we know at the factual level, and, and we also are told at the factual level, there's no supernatural. So at the factual level, there's no supernatural. We're going to die. There's no escape. Uh, good is not going to triumph at the factual level. And yet underneath, almost, he says, very, all human beings feel, but there shouldn't be death. We're not meant to die. We're not meant to lose our loved ones. Good should be triumphing over evil. See? There ought to be a supernatural world. Should, we shouldn't be just stuck in time and then we're dead. But at a deeper level, we feel like this is how reality ought to be. In fact, this is, that's the reason why Tolkien believed that even though fairy stories at the factual level aren't true, most people feel in some ways they are true. They point to an underlying reality that's almost more true than the way life is actually being lived in this world. That's the reason why we still pay good money to see the kind of, the, that's the reason why the happy endings, that's the reason why the heroic sacrifices that bring good out of, uh, you know, to triumph out of, out of defeat and all that, well, that's, well, that's, what we, that's what we still want to watch. We don't want to read Ulysses. We don't, want to, we don't want to read high literature that's nice and nihilistic because that's the way life really is. We say, well, maybe it is, but it shouldn't be. And that's the reason why the popular stories tend to be like fairy tales and so Lewis C.S. Lewis though he was an atheist really 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 felt the power of the myths and the legends and the fairy tales and he loved them but he said even though they point to a kind of what life ought to be like they're really not it's that you know they're not true and and as he was walking along with Tolkien that day he said something like this he said yes but myths fairy tales are lies though breathed through silver myths are lies even though they're breathed through silver as beautiful as they are as much as they point to the way I think the life really ought to be they're just the lies and Tolkien said no they're not and he says here's why I'd say they're not look at the gospel look at the story of Jesus do you realize what you have there everything that moves you about a story escape from death a love that conquers death good triumphing over evil heroic self-sacrifice and and when everything looks the darkest life out of death triumph out of victory uh, out of defeat everything you want in a story Lewis said yes it's true but he says I want you to see something the gospel story of Jesus is not one more wonderful story pointing to the underlying reality Rather, Jesus is the underlying reality to which all the stories point. And the reason we know that is because of the resurrection. See, Tolkien says the resurrection is what happened. The resurrection was, was this underlying reality breaking into this world. And the way life ought to be, and the way life is, Jesus Christ is our great captain. He's opened up cleft in the pitiless walls of the world. He's opened, he's punched a hole through that concrete slab between life as it is and life as it ought to be between the ideal and the real and now because of the resurrection the resurrection proves that the cross was not a defeat it was a triumph it proves that it's that Jesus made satisfaction for sins it proves that now God can come into your life it proves that now Jesus can come into your life because he's alive he says take a look at the evidence for the resurrection he basically said that the resurrection means that Jesus is not one more beautiful story that makes you feel good for a while and then 
the lights dim and you walk out into the real world. Jesus Christ is the underlying reality to which all the stories point, breaking into our world. And that's the reason why there's a place where uh, in the fairy tale, in this, on fairy stories, Tolkien says this. He says, the peculiar quality of the joy in a successful fairy tale can be explained as a sudden glimpse of an underlying reality. But the Gospels contain a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of those wonderful fairy stories. The Gospels contain the greatest and most complete conceivable eucatastrophe, which is the good catastrophe. The catastrophe is the old Greek word for a world-changing turn. He says, the story of the gospel has entered history and the primary world. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. The whole story ends in joy. There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true than Jesus' life, and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. So I'm sure we all learned a new word today, eucatastrophe. Challenge you to use that in conversation this week. So I, I loved what um, Keller points out in this whole um, kind of expose of, of the fiction and, and how um, C.S. Lewis was drawn from atheism to theism and to Christianity. Uh, I actually had a, a friend who, when he was in university, he and his friends used to read C.S. Lewis, and they none of them was a Christian. And years after they graduated from UBC at that point, uh, they met up again. And they had been reading C.S. Lewis as a kind of a study group or a reading group, and, and read Narnia, which most people who have followed C.S. Lewis at all have, have come across Narnia. And as they were talking, um, Dao was the the friend of my friend Brad, and, and he said, don't you wish sometimes that there really were an Aslan? And it was a moment when Brad, who now had come to understand um, who Aslan was as a caricature of Christ, and and could talk about knowing him and, and knowing how the, the stories of Aslan uh, lo in a lovely way, kind of fill out uh, the historic story about Jesus Christ. So we, we'll be talking all summer long about a longing. And my aim for our times together is certainly that we will learn some things. I think there are, there are many things concerning uh, those things that are yet future to us. Um, that are challenging and, and we don't understand them very fully just yet, but there are ways that we need to have a look at scripture and, and even other literature and, and arts uh, to understand how they will sort of fit in together. But while we will learn those things, my hope is that more than anything else, we will discover a longing. Um, we, we will parse out what we mean by a longing, I'm sure several times. Uh, Sehnsucht is a German technical term which, which it talks about a deep yearning. We use the word nostalgia and by nostalgia we think we mean a longing for something that once was um, and, and then we should think about what, what, what it would, would it be to have backwards nostalgia? What if it wasn't longing for something that once was but is something that is yet to be, that it's a backwards kind of nostalgia? a longing and for us to look into our hearts and our minds and ask what what do i long for i mean what are those things that um are deeply embedded in who i am and what i hope what i long for as uh, i try to peer into the future uh that kind of gray misty area of the eschatology of the Bible, the end times of the Bible. What, what am I hoping for? What am I looking for? And what do I know um, by the stories of the Bible, by what I sense in my own humanness, by what I learn from God's already creation about what that is, um, the all things new of the book of Revelation.
I want to take you to a very simple little encounter that uh, points out the the dynamic of this longing, the 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 way that it it pushes us into probing questions, um, wondering about situations and. The story that I'm going to refer to is in Luke chapter 7. And it's a story about two of the disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is waning in not only his ministry, but his very life. And he begins to wonder, I, I guess someday, he begins to wonder about the Messiah. He has been preaching down by the Jordan River in his um you know, camel skin coat and eating his locusts and wild honey and calling Pharisees bad names. And he he sees Jesus coming and he says, look, there he is. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, J- John then baptizes Jesus. There's this incredible demonstration of the presence of God and of the Holy Spirit. But as John is now sort of fading into, um, you know, the destiny that has been chosen for him. He begins to wonder about Jesus. Maybe maybe the the kind of fanfare, in the best sense of that word, has not come about that should have come if the the promised Messiah was, in fact, uh, uncovered, unveiled, introduced. So here's what we find in Luke chapter 7, verse 20. John sent these disciples, and here's what they said. John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Are are you the one, or should we expect someone else? And um, inherent in that word expect is the longing that we're referring to. We've been longing for the Messiah. That that's been the whole hope of Israel. That's been the uh, the focus of their attention as they try to understand the cloudy, dark future for the nation of Israel. They said, "Well, it will be that the Messiah will will be introduced." And so John is saying, "Well, are you that one?" Because we've been longing for the Messiah to come. And is it you, or should we keep on longing? Is there more for us to long for, to look for? The longing that we're describing, I I think is very, very well put by our friend Sam G. Um, Where he wonders if if death has been reversed or canceled out for some, is it possible that every sad thing will come untrue? Is it possible that every sad story will come untrue? Is it possible that every sad situation will come untrue? That's what I hope we'll be able to dig away at in in our lives because we all need to examine what are the sad things of our lives um, in which we had different hopes, in which we had different dreams. And now we kind of look into that misty, cloudy future and we wonder, is there some glimmer of hope that comes in this sort of secondary application thing that Keller talked about? where what we know isn't real or isn't true, it should be true. So even though we know there are the facts of the things that are the sad places, the sad things, sad times, sad people of our lives, somewhere in us, in our humanness, don't we long to ask, is it, is it at all possible that that could, could come untrue? John the Baptist's disciples said, is it you or is it, is it not you? Is, is there someone else that we should long for? So here's what Jesus answers, and it's a lovely answer. He, he, he first of all doesn't say a thing to them. And he, after he has allowed them to hang around for a while, watching him at work, 
And, and that's exactly what he did. He, he just let them watch him at work. Here's what he finally turned around and said to John's disciples. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. What is that answer? That answer is Sam Ganji's questions. Is it, is it possible that everything sad will come untrue? Jesus said, here are the sad things. And, and he just picks on a catalog of observable sad issues, sad realities in people's lives. And he, he said to John, you're wondering if I'm the one you've been longing for. Well, what I want to remind you about and show your disciples is that what you have been longing for is what I have come to announce, um, to introduce, and finally to bring about in the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth. So, so Jesus picks on those, those kind of human dilemmas uh, that says these are real, but they shouldn't be. This is a true story. Each one of these characters may have a true story, but it shouldn't be. We shouldn't have these things in our human existence. And Jesus says, you don't need to long for somebody else. You can long for me and receive me uh, because I've come to bring about the kingdom. A beautiful picture um, in which Jesus is saying, it's as simple as this, that the story that God tells is a story that has a true ending. The, the good story of God told in the whole uh, catalog of scripture, that story is one that has a happy ending. Not only do sad endings come untrue in God's good stories, but every good ending becomes even truer. And we'll talk later about the fact that um, the, the happy endings of the gospel and its implications in our world are beyond our imagination. They're more colorful, more, more um, experienceable, or existential. They're, 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 they're louder. They're, they, they taste sweeter. All, all the ways that we could try to imagine sensing a new world, then we, we kind of push that out to the limit and say all, all of the good stories that God tells have good endings, have a happy ending, have a true ending. So Jesus says to the disciples of John, go on back and tell them, you don't need to look for anyone else. As, as Keller said in, in the video, there's no story um, in, in human history that, that humans would love more to be a true story than that of Jesus Christ. I'm going to refer you as we as we conclude this today to the book that I suggested last week, which is called All Things New uh, by John Eldridge. And as we think about this this um, question from Sam Ganji, um, what Jesus says about um, the longing that you have, I've brought the satisfaction of that longing. The fact that the stories of our human lives, the stories of God's word, are all longing forward. And that's, I think, what we'll discover, that all of our longing is forward. Everything that is a part of the story of the Bible is somehow or other longing forward. It longs forward towards Jesus. That's what John's disciples would understand. But then it longs forward to something past Jesus, which is actually the enthronement of Jesus as the King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords. So we'll be looking into our hearts and we'll be wondering about the things that we long for. And we'll be, we'll be courageous enough um, to identify the things that are the sadnesses of our lives. And we'll wonder with Sam Gamgee, um, is it true that sad things will become untrue? All the sad things 
in life. Everything sad is going to come untrue. In, in All Things New by John Eldridge, he gives this little imagination exercise, and uh, I'll read it to you. You'll see it on the screen. He says, picture a treasure chest, not a small box that might hold jewelry on a girl's nightstand, a large treasure chest, larger than any suitcase that you own, larger than any suitcase you've ever seen. Picture a massive oak treasure chest like pirates might have used with large iron hinges and a huge clasp. The size and age and strength of this strong box say it was made for the most valuable things. Inside this chest are all of the things you wish could somehow be restored to you. Everything you have lost, everything you know you will lose, what fills your treasure chest? Dare we hope that all of the sadnesses will come untrue. Cross the cross thing. 